Now we're looking at the second message in 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18, the church's responsibility to honor its elders. So let's read our, our text again so we get our bearings. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. All elders need to be honored, but here he talks about a special honor, double honor. In a, in a way, Paul skillfully includes all elders. All elders should be honored, but those who uh, lead well and uh, those who are teaching, laboring and teaching, they get double honor. Now, what does this double honor mean? My opinion is that it means this. It refers to both respect and remuneration. Both ideas are included here. The normal esteem, which the word at heart means, esteem, respect, consideration, and then bringing in the second idea of some kind of material provision. Now, if that is not true, and if I'm wrong about that, there's another interpretation that's very simple, and that is this. Paul is using the term double honor figuratively for extra honor, more abundant honor. So all elders are to be honored, but these ones, because of their labor, are to receive extra honor. Now let's look at the word honor itself. The word honor means respect, consideration, high regard. That's the general meaning of the word. But in certain contexts, and it all depends on context, it will include monetary aid. Let me give you an example. In chapter 5, verse 3, and you may have your Bible nearby, in chapter 5, verse 3, he says this, honor widows who are truly widows. Now, what does he mean, honor widows who are truly widows? Does he mean just tip your hat to them, say hi to them, show them some respect? Well, that is included, but he means far more. Honor here includes material life provisions. Look at verse 16, makes it very clear. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them let the church not be burdened, burdened financially, so that it may care for those who are really widows. In other words, if the church has too many widows to care for, it will be burdened financially. Practically speaking, they couldn't do it. And so Paul says, your, your families, your family units are to care for their own relatives who are in this kind of financial need. So right there, it's very clear that he's talking about financial uh, obligations to these uh, uh, destitute widows. And then in chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, it's very clear from verse 18, which we'll look at in a moment, that he's talking about honor that includes financial remuneration. But then in chapter 6, he talks about the slaves, and he wants the slaves to honor their masters. Well, there he doesn't mean money. He just means honor, respect, consideration to their master. So it's context, context, context always that helps us to understand how the writer, the sacred writer, is using these words. So we see here he speaks of honor, double honor to the elders. Now he uses the word honor rather than a more mercenary word because it's very, very typical of Paul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9 where he talks the, the, throughout these two chapters about the offering to the, uh, by, by the Gentile churches to Jerusalem, he doesn't use those kind of words. He uses words like grace and liberty and love and partnership and service. He uses all of these more Christian terms to express financial giving and even the collection of money. So when he says double honor, he is saying that the remuneration or the, the financial aid you give these elders is really an honor to them. So you see, he's bringing out the real heartbeat of what their giving is. It's what they deserve, this kind of honor. And it's something they're entitled to. And it stresses thoughtfulness and um, a loving concern and esteem. So double honor deals with respect and remuneration. Now, this is so important to him that we get this straight, that 
he gives us two scriptural quotations, one from the Old Testament and one from the New. So it's very obvious this is important that he backs this up with scripture. Now, he says, the scripture says, the ultimate authority says. He is doing two things. First of all, he's emphasizing here his point, but he's also clarifying his point, what the double honor means. If you have any question about it, just look at verse 18. The four says it's explanatory. For the scripture says that should alert every concerned Christian to this is a biblical principle. It's the ultimate voice of authority. It's God's word. John 10, 35. Scripture is God's word. Both Moses and Jesus agree that those who labor in the word of God are to be cared for materially. Now, the first quotation comes from Moses from Deuteronomy 25, 4. You shall not muzzle an ox when it's treading out the grain. Now, in this particular passage of Deuteronomy, the entire larger context is dealing with equity and justice in daily life, which will even include rights for animals. Yes, rights for animals. And so you've got this large oxen, and he is treading out the grain. He's stepping on the grain, breaking away the seed from the chaff. It's hard work, and he has to do this for hours upon hours. Well, you don't put a muzzle so he cannot eat because he wouldn't have the strength to keep laboring. So you're even concerned about the animal that he has proper nutrition and provision so he can do his work, which is ultimately work for you. This is fairness and equity and justice. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter nine, which we all have not time to go look at, but in 1 Corinthians nine, Paul picks up this same verse from the Old Testament and applies it to himself and to all itinerary gospel preachers. They are not to be muzzled. In other words, the people are to give them life necessities in order for them to continue traveling and preaching the gospel. This is a biblical principle. And he even says, is, is, did God write this for the oxen? Oxen can't read. No, it's for our sake God gave this principle. It has lots of good application. Now, this passage implies that the provisions are to be adequate living support, not just a mere token gift. The worker, the laborer, needs to be cared for so that he can continue his work. Now, the second quotation comes from Jesus, and it comes from Luke 10, 7. The laborer deserves his wages. Now, this passage actually deals with the 70. Christ sent the 70 out to proclaim the kingdom and proclaim his kingship and to call Israel to repent and be prepared for the king who is near. And what he says to them is, as you go out, you will be cared for by those who hear the message and respond. Don't worry, because the laborer deserves his wages. In other words, you're laboring. You're laboring, men, as you proclaim the gospel, as you travel, as you're away from your family, away from your normal work, you are going to need to be cared for. You got to eat, you got to drink, you have to sleep someplace. Well, the people will care for you because you're deserving of that. Now, Paul takes that passage and he now applies it to the church elders. Notice that. It's very important. And he says the laborer deserves his wages. In other words, these elders are laborers. They're laboring men. They're laboring in the gospel. They're laboring in the teaching of the word. They're laboring in caring for the flock of God. And let me tell you, as a person who has spent his whole life doing this, it is hard work. It's demanding work. It really never ends just goes day and night, seven days a week. In fact, uh, you try to get time away. It's very demanding. And so the principle applied by the apostle of the words of Jesus is this, that elders are laboring men, and consequently, they deserve their wages. They deserve to be cared for and provided for. Now, that is the congregation's responsibility. This is so important. Paul teaches the same thing in Galatians 6.6. 6. One who is taught the word must share all good things. That means material things with the one who teaches. Let me read that to you again. It's the same concept. The one who is taught the word must share all good things, material things, with the one who teaches. This is a biblical principle. It's a principle of biblical eldership and it's directed to the church. Elders are to be cared for financially. 
provisions need to be made. Now, there is nothing said in this text about how this is to be done. Let me remind you that the Church of Jesus Christ is for all nations, all tribes, all places of the world. It's for Africa and India and China and the USA and England and South, uh, South America, for all over the world. Church of Jesus Christ is every place. And so the Bible is written in a way, the New Testament is written in a way that is very adaptable and flexible to any culture at any time in history and to whatever the local circumstances might be. And so the principle is this, the laborer deserves his wages. He is actually entitled to this double honor. He deserves it. How you do that, how you would implement this principle, will be based on the local circumstances. Some churches are in very, very poor places, and so they may only be able to give very little. Other places, there's plenty of money, and the people can very easily, the families can support someone. He doesn't even say how many. In fact, he uses the plural here, elders. And so in a larger church like Ephesus, which was a larger church, Paul spent three years there. It was probably much more like Jerusalem. There have been numerous elders laboring in the word, some part-time, some quarter-time, some half-time. We are very, very flexible in how this is implemented. So local circumstances, the church with its leaders will have to determine how this will be applied and implemented in your particular situation. But get the big principle. Elders are important and indispensable to the church. Shepherding elders. The church's responsibility to them is to show them double honor because they deserve it. They're entitled to it. Which will include not only esteem and respect, but some kind of material provision for their life. You will have to make a decision of how that works out in your local church. The important thing is respect them and provide for them and care for them. This is one of the greatest needs the church has for good leaders and for good teachers and preachers. That's how the church grows. That's how it's protected. That's how it becomes healthy. Let us follow these great authoritative apostolic principles.